I'm not Lorna Richardson, um, and welcome to Jackass. Um, no, um, <laughs> um, right, so um, Lorna does really excellent uh, work for her PhD um, looking at the barriers to participation in, um, in digital community archaeology, public <coughs> archaeology. Um, so, her PhD research at UCL's Centre for Digital Humanities is focused on the communication of UK public archaeology through digital technologies. In this paper, we'll touch on uh, and explore some issues from the perspective of the creation and consumption of public archaeology on the web, as well as on wider issues of inequality in the digital world that impact on the subject and need some considerations. Attitudes to archaeology as a discipline are shaped by the media. The practices of archaeological communication online are increasingly becoming means by which we create which, with, by which we create communality with non-archaeologists. And, as with all media, we must ask, what are these media doing? Whose interests are being served? And what are these communication platforms being used for? Um, the growth of the World Wide Web over the past 20 odd years has seen an improvement in access to cheap computers and software, improvements in access to broadband, wireless and mobile technology, and the churning development, improvement and speedy obsolescence of social media platforms. These developments have forever changed the landscape and format of human interaction. The tools of social media have, to paraphrase sociologist Malcolm Gladwell, upended the traditional relationship between authority and popular will. There has been a critical cultural shift in thinking about how we use the internet and what we use it for. The internet has developed from technologies that simply facilitated information seeking and passive involvement with the information found to an internet of technologies that actively encourage community building, participation, and information creation. This is Web2 or social media, as we all know. Cornelius Holtorf, an academic and researcher at the archae uh, and researcher looking at ar archaeology as a brand, has said that archaeology must engage with popular culture if it is to survive. Public expectations for the participation and interaction with it, anything, let alone cultural heritage, have grown as the participatory web has developed. If the archaeological sector can better understand the public and commercial benefits of engaging with the, pu the public audience through the internet, it will be better able to influence and direct public support for its own roles and more arcane interests, especially in these times of agonizing budget cuts. The use of these social and participatory media could perhaps offer new ways for the internet using public to explore, appreciate, and experience representations of the past in greater depth and with increased nuance than that provided by the heritage industry in the real world. In what has become a competitive and diverse leisure market for attention during our free time. And it's important to remember that the most, for most members of the public, archaeology is a leisure interest rather than a full time obsession. From the perspective of, of social inequalities, digital, <coughs> digital technologies appear to offer communities and individuals the potential to radically improve their lives and expand their social networks. In, social sense, uh, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or which political system governs their lives. Cyber utopians would claim that through web-based communications, these technologies are able to foster multi multifocality and new dialogue in archaeology, present and encourage new interpretations, underpin new power relations between professional and non-expert, non and support representations of community-constructed archaeological knowledge, all at the same time. And further, they, they can subvert the creation and sharing of archaeological data from structural control and redistributing access to cultural resources. The distinction between archaeologists and non-archaeologists can be fluid online. The distinction between a professor and an undergraduate on Twitter, for example, can only be seen in the context of a 160-character bi uh, biography. The content which is often obscure and may not provide any links to identify the tweeter as a member of any real life institution. The content and quality of the communication is what seems to count, and many popular and informative members of the archaeological community on Twitter are not professional academics. Credentials are not what matter to many cyber utopians such as Clay Shirky. Mass peer production, crowdsourcing, the public performance of competence online is absolute. 
Yet these credentials impact how we understand and acknowledge the notion of the expert. The way in which the expert knowledge is presented and performed is vital to establishing authority. The evolution of the internet seems to bring hope to ending the inequalities in offline participation, and only a few years ago was destined to transform the nature of information access and exchange. The web has made it easy to discuss, comment, and act on world events. If we are to believe the hype, instant international exposure via social media will bring down governments, expose corruption, and end violence in Africa and the Middle East. Instead, I think it should be argued that it's time for a radical technological evangelism, that, that the time for radical technological evangelism has run its course. We need to be realistic. The internet is not pro-democracy. It's not inherently emancipatory. It does not create equality and access to data by the simple fact of its existence. It is not always what we think it is. Uh, a combination of naivety, utopianism, and reluctance to delve deeper into the social mechanics behind social media have prevented us from shining a light into the dark corners of internet use. There are many debates about the implications of the internet for social inequality, though the dem democratization of online communication and production, yeah, through the democratization of online communication and production, thanks to tools such as blogs and wikis, we've stretched the boundaries of belonging. The internet remain the blah, though. That was a though at the beginning. Making sense? Um, uh, the internet remains an exclusive enclave for those who can use it. The barriers and inequalities propagated by the internet are far more subtle and nuanced than those who have access and those who do not. The inequalities that I'm talking about include, or Lorna's talking about, inequalities of access to technology, including hardware, software, and connection speed, inequalities in technical ability and confidence with technology, access to inter institutional and social support networks, the freedom to use internet technologies when and where needed, and not in places that limit it, such as the public library or local authority workplaces. The web is pre-configured in subtle but politically important ways which result in exclusion. It is not just a case of not being on the internet. The internet itself is distorted in favor of those who are wealthy in technical uh, knowledge or economic resources. Through the mechanism of biased search engines, knowledge of how to contribute to social media and use it effectively, Understanding the unspoken rules of behavior in online communities, both as communities of practice and communities of interest. Knowing where to search for information efficiently, knowing how to use certain types of software, how to troubleshoot problems, how to ensure privacy and safety online, how to ascertain online credibility, and how to promote your own opinions, your own authority. These are all important technical inequalities depending on whether or not your own equipment or whether you own your equipment or have to use a computer in a library, whether you can access Wi-Fi or broadband, and whether or not you have access to a smartphone and all the important 3G or Wi-Fi connections on the move. Despite the interest in the existence and effectiveness of these digital architectures of participation, these issues deserve to be considered. Are these technological developments really helping citizens to establish new relationships with archaeology and heritage issues based on democratic and participatory principles? Or are we simply witnessing the creation of a new form of inequality? What do we want from our digital public archaeologies? And do these desires match the desires and abilities of those who want to consume the information and opportunity who work, those who want to consume the information and opportunities to participate that we provide? Barriers exist for both producers and consumers of archaeological or any information, and I now want to briefly visit some of these. Data is readily available this is, yeah, um, for the growth of the public internet use in the UK. Last year, the Office of National Statistics report on household internet, internet use showed 5.7 million households in the UK did not have internet access at all. Across Europe, social media is the primary online activity, uh, accounting for one in every five minutes spent online. Yet research by Eurostat la uh, last year showed that nearly a quarter of EU citizens have never gone online, and that in the poorer countries of Southern and Eastern Europe are, are lagging behind Northern Europe, and there is a pan-European problem with rural broadband access. 
The most common barriers to the use of the internet in Europe include the age of the user, older people are less likely to participate, hardware costs, lack of access to cheap broadband, and a lack of RCT skills. Half of those that did not have a connection declared that they felt that they did not need the internet. In the, U uh, in the UK, the, office, uh, the 2011 Office of National Statistics Statistical Bulletin showed that the public confidence with IT was significantly low. Even in regular users, 21% of internet users said that their current IT skills were so bad that they couldn't protect themselves online from a virus or keep their data secure. Of 5.7 million people in the UK without an internet connection, 21 said that their lack of digital literacy was their biggest barrier. There are significant socio-economic inequalities and a lack of basic IT skills across Europe and access to super-fast broadband is a sticky issue. The Adopt a Monument scheme in Scotland is actively promoting the digital dissemination of the project's outputs through mobile phone apps and QR codes as these are cheap and quick to set up. But only 66% of Scotland has 3G access and most of the uh, Adopt a Monument participants did not have any IT skills or access to IT equipment whatsoever. So they had to try to provide training and basic skills before the participants could participate in the project fully. What people can and can't find or use or do on the internet dictates what the internet means to them. If people cannot fill in official forms online or find cheap deals on their car insurance, they're at a serious financial disadvantage. You can't participate fully and effectively in a modern society without establishing some relationship with internet technologies. The average age of the volunteer sector in archaeology may be a contributing factor to the slow uptake of the online archaeology in voluntary groups. In 2009, CBA Community Archaeology Report showed that the average age of any, an archaeological society member is around 55, whilst the average history society member is over 60. During my research, during Lola's research, this has come up time and time again. The majority of people involved in community archaeology are unfamiliar with the digital world, and as a result are very suspicious of it. You cannot interrogate online archaeological data or use resources to their full potential if you don't have the skills. So how can we expect high levels of involvement in archaeology to spring from online sources if a significant number of our target audiences are simply not able to join us online? It's well-known and well-researched fact that social communities online, some people actively participate more than others. The researcher who orig originally came up this, with this idea, Jacob Nielsen, called it the pra this participation inequality. Although the exact percentages are likely to vary depending on context, Nielsen found that social participation online tends to follow a 99-1 rule, where 99% of the users are the audience. These are people who like a good lurk on the internet and tend to read, listen, or observe, but don't actively contribute. 9% of users are editors, sometimes modifying content or adding to an existing thread, but rarely creating new content. And only 1% of users are creators, and these are the people who drive a large amount of the community's activity. More often than not, these people are creating a vast percentage of any, any site's new content and activity. This dispositional barrier is the underlying factor. Without motivation to contribute, just having access to a computer does not serve the problem of the participatory divide. And that's not to suggest that learning is a bad thing. Lurking is learning, after all. And we can't measure how many of these lurkers translate into offline visits to museums, books being bought, archaeology courses being studied, as we just don't look hard enough for that kind of data. The risk with participation inequality is that it can render contributions and opinions found online unrepresentative of the community at large, at large since their contributions may re represent an active vocal minor minority with sharp digital elbows. The strength of doing public archaeology online is the speed at which crowds can be assembled, audiences gathered and action can take place across the boundaries of age, affiliation, and occupational status. The recent issue of the Cherry Mount Cranog, under threat from development without rigorous archaeological investigation, put in, uh, saw victory in the northern, uh, uh, 
saw victory for the, community, the Northern Irish community campaigning after only a sustained online campaign through social media that led to coverage in the national media after the normal channels of complaint and protest had been exhausted. The question is how to sustain the intensity of these encounters with public archaeology. As quickly as a crowd can gather, it can disperse. Weak ties online require little or no acknowledgement of relationships, and there is little or no commitment involved in participation, making it easy for our participants to rendezvous and depart consciously or simply drift from attentiveness to benign neglect. Social media can enhance our existing channels of communication. Agile tech makes it easy for activists to express themselves, but the, these are not in themselves the natural enemy of the status quo. Participants able to quickly mobilize in the face of issues <coughs> such as their Cherrywood Crown, which, which puts those without access to social media or those who don't know how to use it effectively at a disadvantage. Trolling. So, we must keep trolling in mind as a, consider, uh, as a barrier to public archaeology engagement online. Aggressive postings on archaeological blogs and discussion lists, whilst thankfully not common, do exist. And these can be exhausting for the organisation or people concerned if it, it is necessary to respond to trolling by correcting inaccuracies or defending their work. On the Portable Antiquity Scheme, uh, uh, they had to remove their 600 people strong discussion forum because of a couple of particularly persistent trolls, and PAS remains the subject of vitriolic blog posts about their work and website content. Paying attention to the trolls takes up staff time and energy, and you need to be sure that you are resilient enough to ignore trolling. The biggest barrier to these archaeological organizations and individuals that do want to use internet technologies is lack of funding and resources. Many organizations have draconian IT policies. Responses to one of my recent surveys on our IT policy has shown that as lo local authorities are political entities, archaeological officers are forbidden to enter any conversation that might lead to a political repercussions as officers cannot be the voice of the authority. All websites, press releases and blogs have to be run by the council or organization official media team and access to social media at work is the most consistent block. The technical quality of these digital products, funded or not, are extremely varied, and the innovations and uptake of new technologies are, according to Laura's most recent research findings, happening within groups and organizations with access to specialist technical knowledge, policies that support the use of the platforms, and dedicated digital staff slash volunteer roles, and most importantly, cash. Social media takes time, and in hard-pressed organizations, this translated into a financial consideration, which may be off-putting to many who would have otherwise undertake public archaeology. <coughs> the successful digital public archaeology projects have, been the benefit, have had the benefit of institutional commitment to using the internet to engage with the public. They have had technical knowledge, skills, and time to create and maintain successful sites. But these organizations are just as vulnerable to the pervading financial climate as any other, and we are already seeing redundancies and reduced budgets in time for public archaeology, including digital. Is there sustainability built into the funding and staffing of these projects? What happens if only a handful or less of people are using and managing these technologies in organizations and they fall ill or leave? <coughs> How can a small community archaeology project compete for intention online if it is time and budget poor with staff or volunteers that don't have the skills and confidence to fully embrace the digital world? How do we make sure that these projects can be carried on by the communities actively taking part in them? And how do we make sure we don't lose the records and archives of this innovative style of public engagement? The most important question we need to pose out to ourselves as archaeologists are, why are we putting the information online and is it useful? Who uses it and how? And the idea that uh, and the idea that public engagement online can be measured quantitatively through hits needs to go away. We need to measure unique visitors and bounce rate in our metrics data and look carefully at the content and frequency of the interactions taking place through social media. The number of followers or likes is unimportant. Quality counts and funding bodies and management need to be made aware that success cannot be measured in web website traffic. Archaeology's relationship with the public must involve new awareness of audience and a willingness to participate in dialogue. 
Archaeologists <coughs> need to develop IT skills and knowledge about website creation. Our capacity for communication with the non-professional needs to increase. We need a wider understanding of social media use, creative content generation and management, and audience needs and impact through the discipline. This could be part of everyday public archaeology practice, not just part of the specialist ghetto in the world of the digital archaeologist, where non-experts fear to tread. This knowledge could be included as part of any archaeology degree course that discusses public or community archaeology, part of professional CPD, or through training and guidelines and best practice provided by national heritage organizations or professional institutions. Historically, archaeology has communicated blindly to an audience it does not understand, with little ability to discern the effectiveness of this archaeology broadcast, or indeed discover whether the archaeology message has been successfully received. The presentation of the archaeology to the public within the realm of the non-linear uh, hyperlinked and participatory web requires new skills and strategies. Although there will be not one easy solution, a deeper awareness of how, where, and why the internet is used or would, is used or not would be a useful start. <coughs>